I just want to clarify something here. I, I was recently, I, I proposed a talk to, another, to a different conference, and uh, I, I proposed a talk about reactive programming, and the feedback that I got from one of the um, people that approves the, the different proposals said, well, it sounds like something, you know, like it's a little bit too UI related. Yeah, so, no, this is not about React JS, okay? So if, if you're expecting a talk on a UI framework, you're in the wrong place. Um, no, this is reactive programming, and uh, so it, it has to do with concurrency, parallelism, asynchrony, if you will. You, you know, th those have different meanings, but um, in the era that we're living in right now, um, asynchrony is actually frequently parallelism because we have so many um, cores and hyper-threading on cores that we can expect to see a lot of parallelism in our, in our processing. So parallel programming, wow, that's pretty cool, right? Um, you know, if you went back even 10 years, parallel programming was a pretty complex topic. Um, and it still can be, but with the approaches that I'm going to be sharing today, it becomes much simpler to succeed with parallel programming. Um, so this, this technical concept of you know, concurrency parallelism, boy, that's exciting, uh, multi-threading. It sounds really you know, like interesting stuff. But notice that the title of my talk is When Concurrent Wax is Fluent. So um, there's an expression in English, waxing, means that you're, that you're kind of like making another thing shine. You're, you know, you're, you're waxing uh, poetic, right? That you're, you're speaking in front of an audience, but you're being poetic, and so you're kind of waxing poetic. Well, this is where concurrency can actually um, highlight or shine uh, fluency, right, in, in programming. And of course, fluency is what we want to achieve with domain-driven design because we're having conversations with uh, business people and software developers together. And so the more fluent that we are in our conversations, the, the, the more comfortable we're becoming with the modeling language that we're um, developing. And as we develop this comfort with the language, then we're reflecting that language in a software model. And so we want the model to read fluently too. So that's what this topic is about. Probably most of you are familiar with my uh, work on uh, authoring some books on domain-driven design. I've also authored a book on uh, um, the, the actor model, so reactive messaging patterns with the actor model. But you probably know me for my uh, DDD work, um, and yet <clears throat> maybe you don't know that I'm uh, working on, I'm, I'm the sponsor of this um, open source project called Vlingo. Um, you might guess where the V comes from in the name, but um, Lingo, you know, leaning toward uh, or, or nodding toward um, the linguistics of d domain driven design. And this platform that is being developed is a reactive platform and it's based on the actor model and you can uh, you know, use the software, it's open source, uh, it's being developed both for Java and .NET. The Java edition is further ahead of the .NET, um, but you can still use um, concurrent reactive programming on, on both of the major um, technical platforms. And maybe uh, a little bit more about my experience with messaging and what was known you know, 30, 35 years ago as inter-process communication, um, I, I had experience with this on Unix, and then I was approached by Microsoft to uh, author a book on um, the OS2 platform, so the o OS2 operating system, and so I got this cool coffee mug out of it. My book never got published because, of course, you know probably what happened between Microsoft and IBM, and IBM 
stuck with OS2 and Microsoft went the Windows route. But, um, but yeah, this is my sort of, you know, um, souvenir from those days when I was spending a lot of time with messaging. So this goes back, you know, more than 30 years ago. So uh, I've, I've kind of seen a lot of different things and, and used messaging quite a bit over the years. Um, so I want to first just discuss where we are in software development right now. And I think you'll probably agree with me that uh, this big ball of mud is probably a familiar concept in your uh, enterprise, wherever you're working. Maybe not. You might be in a startup on completely greenfield systems, but my guess is even in a startup, you're probably integrating with something. And if you're integrating with legacy systems, you're probably experiencing some uh, discomfort with the big ball of mud. I will distinguish the difference between a big ball of mud legacy system and, a, and just a legacy monolith. There is a difference, but this is where we are, right? We see a lot of this. And I have to say, too, that um, most of the companies that contact me for training and consulting are doing so with a mind toward getting out of this. They want to leap from the legacy big ball of mud into microservices, right? Because, um, well, microservices have a big advantage, but what they're really saying is just get us out of the mud because this is rendering, this, this kind of result is rendering organizations to a point where they're only making releases like once or twice a year on major systems. These are systems that they've made their fortunes on earlier you know, in their life cycle. And it could well be that these companies that are now facing this are in the, the throes of death. We may not see the companies actually die until 10, 15, 20 years from now because it takes these you know, billion dollar fortune companies to many billions of dollars fortune companies to, to completely you know, go into non-existence. Or, but they are facing a lot of entropy right now. So what I'm going to try to do is help you to avoid this. You may not be able to altogether avoid it because you still face it with existing systems, but avoid it in the future. Um, we also face blocking, a lot of blocking. When you make an HTTP request from a client, you're, you're in the client position and you're making an HTTP request, your client is probably almost certainly blocking, waiting for the response to come back from the HTTP request. And you're blocking because the client software that, that you're using is designed in a blocking way. And actually, if it wasn't blocking, you may not know what to do if it returned immediately but without a response, right? That may make you or teams in general uncomfortable. So maybe we're happy for the blocking, but um, it sure makes our software very inefficient, okay? And, um, and it's also blocking for the time frame that it's blocking because the service that it's using is also blocking on other things, okay? And we'll, we'll look at that. So for example, um, this, what I'm showing you here is a, are just two objects, like two objects in a VM. This is not a client service and a server service that are remote from each other. This, this is an image of two objects collaborating in a single VM, like a Java, two Java objects or C sharp objects. And when the client object requests some behavior, some operation from the server object, so it's requesting a service from the server object, it's blocking, the client blocks. And if the server uses any other objects behind it, which it likely will, it's blocking too. So this is a large degree of why the client on the HTTP client side is blocking. And then this is blocking 
for longer than we want to because when we use I.O., the I.O. is blocking. So we're experiencing, you know, a lot of blocking, blocking all over the place. And again, we probably feel comfortable with that because if, if we're not experienced with asynchrony, it may actually make us feel uncomfortable to have the freedom to process more things on less threads than you know, we're used to because, well, what do we do, right? So it, does, it, it requires a bit of a different mindset to use non-blocking uh, pro non programming model. But these things, this, this blocking, while it may make us feel comfortable, it's what we're accustomed to, it is also extremely inefficient. And so what you will see is these uh, client and server solutions that are deployed into production often have a lot of different servers, a lot of different nodes um, participating in this service that's, or services that are being provided because everything is blocking, everything is inefficient. And so, we, you know, we might have dozens, even a hundred or more different servers, physical hardware servers involved in, um, in the infrastructure of making these run because we have to handle more than a few dozen requests per second. We're also experiencing this a lot, anemic domain model. And I just like to clarify at this point that I'm only using the word, the words domain and model together here with anemic because you'll know what I'm saying. But I think that it's paying far too um, heavy of a compliment to this kind of software to even use the words domain model to describe it because they're really not domain model and yet anemic domain model is the name that's given to this kind of software. Why is it anemic? Because this is pretty much what we're talking about. Um, okay, this is Java code, maybe you're, this is NDC conference, maybe you're more of a .NET C Sharp developer. Um, so, uh, but you know, you can well imagine that this, this is an attribute, an entity attribute rather than an entity annotation, same thing, right? Um, so this client class is marked as an entity, and then it has a field or an attribute named ID that's a string, and that is annotated as an identity. And then the rest of these are annotated as columns. So what are we doing here? This is just um, a high-level programming language, happens to be a language capable of object-oriented designs and, and implementations, and yet we're, we're not really using OO at all in the way that it was meant to be used, but we're just using objects like this to shovel data you know, into the database, back out of the database, make some changes to it, put it back in. This is anemic, right? And it's not a domain model. Um, the reason it's called a domain model is because you know, it is in a, an object-oriented language, but we probably are not experiencing any of the benefits typically gained by a domain model. And the reason that I like to be very definite in saying that this is not a domain model is because when I attend and, and am in your position sitting in the audience listening to a speaker talk about this kind of software, they refer to it as a domain model. And I would just want you to be um, educated. This is actually not a domain model, okay? So whenever anybody calls this a do domain model, call them on it, right? It, it's not. Um, okay, so that's a bit of ranting. Where, where do we go from here? Where should we go from here? Um, so I just wanna take a perspective I tweeted this, you know, it's, it's really weird um, when, you know, you're in a lot of daylight at nighttime and I couldn't sleep last night until about 5 a.m. So I was just thinking, you know, what is this Agile thing all about? You know, like why, why does Agile keep failing? And so I, 
I created these two tweets, and I just, you know, I described this in a meetup that I had last night, and it's just something that's been on my mind, is Agile really needs domain-driven design. Because, and, and domain-driven design is meant to be used in an Agile way as it is, but Agile needs domain-driven design because um, it, domain-driven design is meant to draw business people, business competency into the software project. And so we have conversations about the software that we're designing. And so if we are getting um, feedback from business people, this is credible feedback because the business people are the ones who understand the business vision or at least should understand the business vision. And while they need some help in understanding how software is developed, if as agile teams, we are being critiqued mainly by other technical stakeholders, it's going to render the results of our software ordinary, right? It's, it's really a subjective design because it's not based on any knowledge that we're gaining or very little knowledge that we're actually gaining from the business, but we're a bunch of software developers saying, oh yeah, that, that sounds good. Or maybe what, you know, what would really be ironic is that some developer, some programmer actually gets the language of the model right and then the team corrects that, correct, you know, corrects the correctness and actually makes it wrong through a review process, right? By saying, no, 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 that's wrong. Because it's just subjective to what the software developers consider to be correct and if they're not paying attention to the business, not seeking business feedback, then you know, the feedback that they're getting is really just you know, leading toward technical merit, but not really a good business result. So um, you know, this is the meaning behind this. And of course, you know, one of the first replies that I get to this, in fact, the first reply that I get to this tweet is, um, saying, why don't we just get rid of Agile? Agile doesn't do anything for us. Well, that's my point, right? Is I'm not saying get rid of Agile, but the reason that we aren't benefiting from Agile is because we're not using Agile in a, in a business feedback loop where we're gaining credible feedback. Instead, we're getting technical feedback, and so we're creating technical solutions that don't fit what the business needs, and, and and maybe we're not even really iterating quickly anyway, so we're not incrementing on value. And so, you know, this is another place where we're kind of stuck, and we have to change that. We have to make software that is not ordinary, that is um, not based on subjective feedback from technical people only, okay? So we do that by, first of all, taking a step to understand by having conversations with business people what a software model, um, how it should be comprised. And we do that by actually basically capturing the conversations that we have and rendering them into a software model. So we, we literally want our software models, our software expressions to read as closely to the human communication that we're having as we possibly can. And this then, you know, will facilitate having conversations with business people who can actually read the code because it makes sense to them and it's not a technical translation. And so to do that then, we're taking the concepts that we're learning in conversation and we're bounding those. We're putting those into a boundary and we say inside this boundary, this model, and the language that we're producing has specific meaning. And that is the bounded context of domain-driven design. Now, you know, some people will, when you ask them how big is a microservice that's a bounded context, they'll say, well, you kind of get a feel for, you know, it starts feeling a little big, and so you start breaking it into another microservice. That's actually not the drivers around DDD, primarily, it, it, 
it, it's not a feeling that you get. It's literally the conversations that you have with business people that tell you what is in context, in a specific bounded context. And if you're having conversations with other business people that are not about this, then it's not in that context. So it's not a feeling that you get. It, it's really, you know, I mean, it can be complex to draw the, these, you know, mental models out of people to, to have conversations about them, but it's really not, again, subjective. It is a matter of understanding what the business needs and creating boundaries around that. Um, you'll also notice, too, that I'm not drawing objects here as rectangles, right? Um, I, I'm purposely drawing them as circles because, um, well, in the, in the year 1973, Carl Hewitt created and, and some colleagues created what was called the actor model. And it's, and it's a concurrent, you know, asynchron, asynchronous way of programming. And the actors are software objects. They're objects, just like object-oriented programming are objects, but they operate in an, in an asynchronous fashion through message passing. Okay, I'll tell you more about that. But I'm distinguishing this because it, with circles because a, a professor, Agha, wrote a book in about 1978 about the actor model, and he drew these objects, the actors, cir circular. So I like to use that as a precedence to show that I'm talking about objects, but you know, objects that have a different, bit different personality than the objects that we're probably used to using. So um, reactive is based on message passing. So it's a message-driven approach to software development. And this, you know, so before we were looking at the, the two squares or rectangles, right, which were, were a client and a server. So this represents the same client and server, but modeled as actors rather than just plain objects, okay? Um, and the difference between an actor object and a typical OO object is, again, that these actors um, communicate asynchronously by passing, passing messages, and the messages are delivered from one actor to another through a mailbox. So, like the server here is receiving uh, message four, but it's already received message one, two, and three, and it's, it's, it's waiting to process, um, or it has not yet processed message one, but it will process those in due order, one at a time, as a thread becomes available to it. Reactive is also event-driven. If we use events to our advantage, the event is a kind of message, but it's a message that's different than um, the blue object. The blue object represents a command object that says, you know, a command expression that says this, do this, right? It's an imperative, do this kind of message, where the aggregate object is emitting um, an event that says, this was done. And so it's, it's sending a message saying, this happened, okay? So that's event-driven. We're capturing facts about something that happened. Okay, so we're going to use reactive, hopefully in the future. We'll benefit from it because of the efficiency that's gained and the natural benefits that, that are gained in the modeling experience. I'll talk more about that. But what about our language investment? Do we have to totally give up the languages, the programming languages that we have so much invested in, in order to use reactive software development? Do we have to give up model fluency? Do we have to give up type safety? Do we, can we test these models that we're developing as reactive software? So that's, that's the goal. So first of all, what is fluent? Um, fluent, I think is an important concept to, to grasp both with the tools that you're using because you don't want the tools that you're using to be an impedance to fluency and then your own efforts to create a fluent model. So fluency, you know, should not come at the expense of a framework or some other kind of tooling. So for example, if you have a tool that um, 
uh, supports a fluent API that you're using for, you know, within a framework or something that's, that's helpful as you're creating a fluent model. Now notice that this, um, the fluency of this model, this is a protocol of a proposal. So this is a model concept called a proposal. And this proposal can receive messages such as submit for, um, deny pricing, verify pricing. These are just three of the messages that it can receive. And notice they look just like method invocations, okay? Because this is an interface, could be a C Sharp or Java interface. Now notice the fluency of the expressions that are used with this proposal. We read just like a conversation that we would have with business people, with our team, proposals submit for client expectations. This is exactly the kind of language that we use or very close to the language that we use as humans communicating with each other when we describe what a proposal provides in terms of behavior, functionality, in behalf of this model. So we say proposals submit or are submitted for client expectations. So a client has some expectations that they're associating with a proposal. And this proposal then will go through some workflow. And as it goes through some workflow, it may be that uh, pricing is being checked on this proposal. Is, is this proposal priced fairly? So this is a question that we have. And so if the proposal is considered to be fairly priced and we've received an event as feedback on the question of is this a fairly priced proposal, then maybe we're receiving this um, as an event outcome. And so this is a place where the client of our proposal will say, well, let me find the actor for that proposal and that's an asynchronous operation. So we ask the stage that the actor lives on, um, can I have the actor of, of this ID as a proposal type? And then when I receive that proposal, I'm going to tell that proposal to verify pricing. Again, this is another asynchronous operation. So while the, the proposal is being looked up, this soft, this code right here is not using a thread. There, another thread is using, you know, it, another piece of software, another component is, compose, is consuming a thread for a moment just to find that actor. But then when that actor is found, this will be given a thread again at some future point. And then the proposal verify pricing will be um, um, executed. Otherwise, though, if we didn't find that proposal, we're going to prov provide a response of not found, so a rest behavior. But if we did find the proposal and we did verify pricing, we're now going to serialize the proposal so that we can send a part of that proposal back as an answer of response of OK and a piece of this proposal object that has some meaning to the client, okay? So this is where you get fluency, um, not only from the software model, but the API, the, the tools, the framework that you're using is not an impedance to fluency, okay? Um, and when you look at this method invocation, you might ask, can this really be reactive, is it really an asynchronous operation because it looks like a method invocation? The answer is yes, because this method invocation, behind the method invocation, the, the invocation is being reified or changed into something of greater value, which is a message, and that message is being dropped in the mailbox of this proposal actor that it's being sent to. And so it will receive this um, the, the stimulus of submit for with client expectations as parameters. Type safe, yes, and it, it's entirely type safe. So you're not giving up type safety in a type safe language. 
um, when, when you're sending messages because you are using um, actually a, an, a type safe interface. And so any parameters that you pass in this message uh, send have to be type safe. And so you have a client from a client ID and you have expectations of, now notice it's not only type safe, but the way that we're assembling these two value objects is in a very fluent manner, okay? Summary has, description has, keywords are, and so forth. So we're, we're actually reading this in the same way that we would speak it among our team. But one kind of you know, thing that crops up in this kind of asynchronous design um, with you know, messaging that where things are happening simultaneously everywhere is the potential for uncertainty. When will things complete? And will they complete in the order that we wish for or anticipate and would happen if we were using a blocking paradigm that we're used to, right? We could count on a certain amount of sequence and order happening and the lack of duplicates because everything is blocking. Everything is, is dependent on you know, something else finishing before we get this, um, the outcome. So how do we deal with the uncertainty, not only at the actor-to-actor -actor level or within a bounded context, but even across multiple bounded contexts? So what I like to emphasize is modeling the uncertainty in the business logic. Okay? And this is a recommendation of Pat Helland in his paper, um, Life Beyond Distributed Transactions. So Pat Helland basically says, and, and Pat Helland, by the way, helped Amazon you know, be hugely scalable and, and asynchronous, um, you know, early on in Amazon's lifetime. And um, Pat Helen said, when you cannot depend on global transactions or, you know, XA, um, um, then model the uncertainty that you will experience in the business logic. And so how do we do that? So here we have this proposal entity. Notice that internally it's called a proposal entity because it is an entity, but the client only knows about the proposal itself. That's the protocol that it's using. So it's an interface. And this happens to be an event sourced uh, proposal. So this entity is event sourced. And notice that we have the client expectations because that was the message sent to initialize this um, proposal. But remember in that um, protocol that there were also um, deny pricing and verify pricing. So this deny pricing and verify pricing is being handled because an event was emitted by this proposal saying proposal was submitted. Okay, so this is a fact. It's emitted, proposal was submitted. And then there's a pricing bounded context that sees this event determines whether or not the pricing is, can be verified or must be rejected, and it emits one of the, those two domain events. And then this model around proposal is seeing one of those two events, and the outcome will be that when, when one of those two events is seen, the model, this model, the proposal, will be told verify pricing or deny pricing, okay? So this is an eventual outcome. How do we though deal with the fact that in this kind of environment, the verify pricing or reject pricing may happen multiple times. It may be delivered because our messaging mechanism may have to deliver multiple times. It's at least once delivery um, contract. Well, here's a way to do that. We model the uncertainty in the business logic. So here we have the proposal entity and we're adding a new concept called a progress. And what this progress is maintaining is over time, it will track the, process, the progress that has been made in bringing this proposal to a point where it can be agreed on to, to um, you know, actually be delivered as, as a task that is completed at some point. So the progress has to track 
that the proposal has been submitted, it has to track that the pricing has either been verified or rejected, and it has to track whether scheduling has been verified and are there any workers who are available to actually perform the task that this proposal proposes. How do we do that? Well, we have this concept at the heart of the software that is called progress, and we are simply maintaining the progress as a value object. So every time that one of these, you know, outer, out of band processes completes and we see a domain event as a result, we're going to tell the proposal to do something and the proposal will track the fact that this has been done by adding a specification to the, the progress that has occurred already. So now we can track from no progress at all to submitted, to pricing verified, to scheduling verified, to workers recommended. We don't care what order those occur in, and we don't care how many times the message is delivered because we can design with item potency because we have this progress and we know what's already been done, and we will not take the next step until all three of those things have occurred. So we're not trying to implement, um, you know, uh, deduplication and resequencing of messages outside of the business logic. We're simply absorbing all of this and saying, you know, we're comfortable with dealing with this as things finish, okay? So, now what about microservices, right? So, um, probably you, you've heard that domain-driven design bounded contexts make good microservices. So, but what does that mean? You know, is, is you know, if, if you were, um, was it uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, you know? If you were Goldilocks, which of these microservices would be just right, right? This one's too big. This one's too small. Ah, this one is just right, yeah? So, yeah, if everybody's going microservices, we should certainly do that. And, you know, here's the thing too, right? This is what the business wants. We as developers have to recognize that the business wants piles of cash, okay? Just face it. But you have a challenge. I, I'm going to put a personal challenge before you to convince your companies that they don't really want exactly this. What they really want is this, right? Some nice, really well-modeled, organized cash, piles of cash, right? Like, just like microservices are. So, yeah, let's get some definitions. This is legacy. If this was legacy that didn't make money, it wouldn't actually be called legacy. It would have never made it to the point of being legacy. It would be named unplugged, right? It would not be running. It's legacy because it accomplishes this. And I want to also provide another definition that's important. A legacy monolith is not the worst thing that you could design, develop, and deploy. So a legacy monolith can be a well-modularized, well-designed piece of software. Okay, you may have some challenges still. Like you see, there are a few what some people refer to as God objects here. You know, they have too much responsibility, too much power, too, you know, too many things going on in them. But when things are well modularized, and it probably represents too that they're well tested, you can, you can refactor these things, these concepts, because um, you'll tend not to break things. Whereas if you're facing this kind of legacy system, beware. You know, refactoring this can be very, very risky. So there's a definition. Let's get a definition, though, of microservice. D does it mean 100 lines of code? Have you heard that, that a microservice is 100 lines of code? 
I've heard also that it should be 400 lines of code, right? And then there are some that are really liberal with the line of code count, and they say 1,000, that makes a better microservice. You know, again, these are all just subjective, um, you know, direction and, and, and opinions of technical people. They're not looking at the business drivers when they're providing this sort of feedback and direction. Okay, so let's just say, though, that we do create a bunch of 100 line of code microservices. You know, and, and, and I want to emphasize that, of course, these will be successful microservices because they're talking to Kafka, right? There's a Kafka, several Kafka topics here, and you can accomplish anything with Kafka. But notice, you, know, you see what's happening here? These are not a big ball of mud. They're actually little balls of mud. Is that fair to say? Well, here's what happens with this kind of granularity. We start to, do, to ask the question, if I took that one little microservice over there and I unplugged it, what would happen to the rest of the system? You know, with even 30, maybe 50 microservices, you may have a difficult time answering that question. It may be that you don't break anything, or it could be that you go into cascading failure and the whole system, you know, goes away. And, and you don't make money right now. So what, about, what do we do about these dependencies? Well, when you don't know the answer to that question, you come up with a different question. And that is, how much would it cost to just leave them all running all the time, forever? Right? And, and so the answer to that question is about $400 a month per microservice. Okay, and then you get to this point. Okay, you've added more topics to Kafka. And you've incurred a lot of infrastructure at AWS or, you know, Azure. And then you start to think about what level of complexity will this system reach at some point. Does anyone here work on or have worked on in the past a two million line of code system? Yeah. Awesome. I have two. I, I don't know that I've ever worked on a five million lines of no code system, but it's hard to tell because what is the definition of a system anyway, right? The definition of a distributed system is that um, your computer doesn't work because some computer you didn't even know existed doesn't work right now, right? So, so how do you even know maybe you are working on a, on a five million line of code system? So if you're working on a two million line of code system, what, what is the cost of 100 line microservices? So that would be 20,000 microservices, and that would be a cost of about $8 million a month to keep all of those running forever. $96 million a year. Then if we step that up to a 5 million line of code system, that's 50,000 microservices. And I have to say, it's not even the cost. I think you're gonna fail far before you ever pay for a few months of, of cost in this, you know? 50,000 microservices, I mean, can you imagine? We can't even keep five things in our mind at one time, right? Try to keep 50,000 things in your mind. Um, so if we take the bounded context approach, it's not subjective if we're paying attention to the drivers of, of the ubiquitous language, the, the conversations that we're having with different business interests, and together we're going to collectively develop a system, maybe different teams are involved, and multiple bounded contexts are involved. But I, I want you to note here, a bounded context is not 100 lines of code. It's probably not even as small as 1,000 lines of code. But I'm not going to tell you how many lines of code is, because it will be the number of lines of code that the ubiquitous language in a software model requires. And that's what it will be. But it's also not going to be a big ball of mud. You know, and if it if it if a bounded context turns into a big ball of mud, you got some other problems to think about, right? So, um, and this is a thing too, right? We want to go beyond the ordinary. We don't want to have ordinary software where we're just seeking, we're stopping at the ordinary business process, but we want to go well beyond that and seek strategic advantage. So we have to tell objects what to do, right? This client is no longer anemic. We're no longer setting a dozen different 
string values on, on fields or attributes. Instead, what we're doing is we're using rich behavior to, to tell the object, do this. Okay? That's how objects were meant to be used. And this, this telling an object what to do can be a, a message delivery rather than just a direct method invocation. And you know what you get out of this kind of client? You get explicit understanding of what's happening to this object. You do not know, if you're a programmer walking into a project for the first time and all this code exists, you do not know why these 12 setters have been setting values on some object. You don't know what that in data encoding means. Whereas if you tell a client object relocate to a postal address, that just makes sense. And notice that we can emit an event out of this client when the client is relocated, and we can tell other parts of the system client relocated, okay? And it's testable. You can test this software. You can test the anemic software data model, but you're never certain that the implicit nature of the model is, you know, actually going to be, um, you know, are we, are we testing everything, all possible permutations that this data can be set? And also notice too, right, that the, that monolith, that well-modularized monolith from before is not the worst thing that you can create because each of those modules might be a bounded context, right? So you can actually use domain-driven design in a monolithic environment. You do not have to go directly to microservices with, you know, the potential for very early on having to solve many murder mysteries uh, along the way, right? So after we have a monolith, if we have a reason such as rate of change within the monolith, in, in different modules, the rate of change is different or we have to scale something differently than the rest of the monolith, and it becomes a pain to deal with these situations within the monolith, then it will be much more um, feasible to break up that monolith into a corresponding number of bounded contexts. But if you want to go from here to here, I just have to tell you, that's not going to be easy. I've done it. It's doable, but it's highly risky, and it's not simple at all, not, not easy. Okay? I do want to say, though, if, if your company is still using COBOL, you might want to think about rewrite. Because the people who wrote this code have at least grandchildren right now. Right? And, and they're, they're enjoying having walks in the park with their grandkids. They don't want to do this stuff anymore. So it doesn't matter how much money you offer them, they're done with it, right? So how do you, though, get from the elephant, right, the, the big ball of mud, and how do you get to that well-modularized monolith and then get to microservices? Well, it's at one byte at a time. This is why it's not simple. It's not simple at all. It should really be change-driven. Even if your company gives you three months or six months to try to break up this big ball of mud, you probably are not going to succeed because you won't have business drivers to do this. It will be arbitrary technical decisions that will be causing the, uh, influencing the changes that you make to this big ball of mud. And so you won't have the, the, the advantage of business-based modularization that you would get with uh, having conversations with the business and, and starting anew with this. So it really needs to be change-driven. It really needs to be value-driven. So you're, you're eating this elephant one bite at a time by you know, creating new value, and you clean up the areas that you're touching to provide new value. You're adding tests. <coughs> you're uh, modularizing things a little bit at a time. And you know, maybe you're adding some event-driven behavior to this, too. So you can strangle the monolith by, by uh, for example, associating events with 
operations that happen in the database. You can use database triggers to do this. You can use tools like Debezium, Oracle Golden Gate to recognize when a row changes or a row is inserted or updated or deleted from a table in the database. You can produce events as an outcome and slowly feed into the new microservices and strangle the monolith a little bit at a time. And as you gain more and more uh, event orientation, message orientation, you can slowly break up the monolith and restructure it and then eventually reach a point where your restructure has, you know, um, you know, sort of this ultimate goal of having reactive microservices. But again, it, it's going to take some time and, and a lot of effort to do that. Um, I just want to show you that in using reactive, you know, this is sort of a typical architecture. If our architecture and our services are really, is really well designed, you know, it's going to be nice and clean like this. But look at how many responsibilities um, are in a architecture, you know, technical stack like this. A lot of responsibilities spread across multiple layers. But if you use reactive with the actor model, you literally can have two layers in your software. You have something in the infrastructure like a REST endpoint. So you have a user interface talking to a REST endpoint. And the REST endpoint can tell the domain model what to do in one step. You can, you can likely erase a lot of those responsibilities at, um, that you would normally have in a different technology stack. So I just wanted to show you the architecture of um, a Vlingo service or a Vlingo application. Uh, a Vlingo application or service would run in a VM such as C Sharp or Java, you know, a .NET, maybe .NET Core um, VM. And, uh, <coughs> and it runs in a world, and the world can have at least one, if not multiple, stages because actors play on stages, they operate on stages. And there are other components like a, a plug-in architecture and proxies and a test kit and supervisors for, um, you know, the the, in case things break, um, supervision is a much better way to deal with failure. And uh, actors, so the, the Vlingo platform is based on the actor model with all message sending. There's, um, you know, the reactive um, uh, HTTP server. Everything, again, is, is fully async, concurrent, parallel, depending on the uh, machine that it's running on, uh, clustered, and a cluster can uh, manage to send messages to any actor in the cluster acl across cluster nodes with, um, without having to know where the actor actually is located. And we support four different kinds of persistence. We do understand that event sourcing is an important way to persist um, your, your domain model, but we also understand that uh, some don't need event sourcing, and some simply will never use event sourcing because of, you know, the complexity that they feel is associated with it. Or maybe they will in time, but they need to take other measures first. And so we also support OR mapping in a few different ways and blob and clob storage through document databases and, and so forth. All of this is reactive. Every single thing about this platform is non-blocking other than if we, if we do I.O. on a blocking database, um, although those operations will, will block for a brief period of time, uh, it's still designed in a way that, that the blocking will be minimized because, for example, using the single writer principle um, and also uh, using different thread pools for um, persistence means that your application or service threads are not being taken up by or being blocked by I.O. 
So I encourage you to take a look at uh, the Vlingo platform. You can find it at um, vlingo.io is our little website, and you can get links there to the documentation and the source code. The source code is open source. Um, it's uh, under the MPL version 2, um, Mozilla Public License version 2. And uh, it's available at github.com slash vlingo. That's the Java edition, and the .NET is at github.com slash vlingo dash net. Okay, so you can experiment with any of those. It's all, we're currently not uh, charging anything for the use of this, and we'd love to support your development of applications in uh, using this platform. So I don't know if we have a few minutes for questions, hopefully. Uh, yeah, we do have a few minutes for questions. Any questions? Go ahead. It's a good question. Um, if you know, like if you're in a greenfield environment and you know that microservice is the ultimate direction to go, you can still use microservices from the start, but I encourage you to take measures like tooling that's available with Vlingo is, um, for example, use in-memory you know, databases and in-memory messaging and, and things like this, instead of, you know, trying to spin up a cluster in AWS or Azure and, and you know, like fighting with that, just simply get something working. And then once you get your model working and, and an understanding of, of the business model and, and have these important conversations early, then you can deploy in, in the sort of cloud native way um, and, and that won't get in the way. But now imagine that you take the opposite approach and, and you decide, oh yeah, well let's go ahead and because, oh man, I can't wait to use you know, AWS or Azure or whatever. And, and what do you do? And you, know, you have this opportunity to talk to the business and they're like, there they go again. They're wasting a month trying to set up you know, the cloud and we should be developing software, and it just makes developers look really immature, right? And, and it is immature to take, to take those kinds of steps when we, the more important thing is developing for the business. So, so yeah, but it could well be that you only really need a monolith to begin with, and so take the monolithic step. There's nothing wrong with it. Modularize, it's just to view microservice as a deployment option, right? It's just a deployment option. It's not, it's not the end in itself, it's a tool, okay? Anybody else? Okay, well, if you're a little shy, you can uh, approach me here after you know, we, we stop. But, um, so thank you for attending. <laughs>